Greetings, hello and welcome back to Good Health. India is going through a tough phase of the COVID-19 virus and the frontline warriors are fighting to keep it, uh, to keep us out of harm's way. My salute to them first. Today will be the second time we are talking to Dr. Meena Subramaniam. She's the Vice President and Global Program Leader Gastroenterology at Takira, the largest pharmaceutical company in Asia. She joins us today from Boston. Welcome back, Dr. Meena Subramaniam. Thank you, Hari. Uh, your earlier talk on this channel on COVID-19 was well received. Today, I have some follow-up questions on COVID-19, the answers for which will be very important for people like us to face the progress of the virus. Okay, before I start with the questions, I wanted to tell you that I just received information that the Chennai city is being locked down again from the 19th to the 30th of June, not all of India, just Chennai. The cases in our mm -hmm. city are rising and uh, uh, we are having a tough time here. So with this background, let me go into my first question to you. Uh, between May 16th, when you spoke here on this channel and today, that's almost a month, how much progress have we, ha I mean, has been made with understanding the virus? The floor is yours. So I think um, a lot of progress is being made um, in one sense, that uh, physicians are understanding better how the virus is presenting itself in patients, what kind of symptoms they are experiencing, um, what type of people the virus is infecting. So every bit of um, knowledge that they gain is actually much more helpful than to educate people about why we need to take this infection seriously, right? Initially, when they came out of the door, they were saying that it's only people who have some health issues or are you know, or, or compromised in some way, uh, they probably are going to be more affected, it's really the older people, so on and so forth. But as time has progressed, it's become apparent that the virus does infect across a spectrum and the, uh, the symptoms experienced by people seems to vary quite a bit. So I think over time, uh, uh, you know, between the last time I spoke to you to now, we have learned a lot more about the various ways in which the virus is infecting. That's one part of it. The other part of it is also some parts of the world have already gone through this experiment of reopening and they're trying to understand whether there's going to be the second wave of infection. Can we open really safely? So New Zealand seems to have done it very well and they seem to be succeeding. There are other parts of the world where, you know, they have had uh, to close down and reopen again. So Germany, parts of Germany had to go under lockdown again and then they reopen. New York is considering whether they have to go into a second lockdown because people are not practicing the sorts of, um, you know, um, uh, distancing measures or um, uh, mask measures and such that have been put in place. Like they're not practicing those sorts of uh, safety measures that were requested of them. So we are also learning what can be done. How much can you push, you know, in terms of uh, following practices or not following practices and then seeing an ensuing rise in infection rates. So we are learning about that. So that's a real experiment that's going on now in the social phase. And then the third thing is we're also learning about what's happening with the candidates that are being advanced uh, for uh, vaccines, right? So we are seeing that two of the candidates have progressed through the early phases. So they are found to be safe and effect uh, not effective is too early to say, but at least they have been found to be safe. Now they're progressing through the second and the third phases of clinical development to try and understand if not only are they safe, but do they work across a range of age groups and then eventually are they going to be protected? So a lot of things are happening in this space. And then finally, in terms of diagnostics, a lot more diagnostics have come into the market. There is more access to patients and people to now get tested. So, wow. so, so can you give us some, you know, a date in the future when the vaccine will be ready? I mean, I mean, have we reached that position? Um, it's too early to say whether, uh, you know, there will be a vaccine in the future, right? Because it all depends on what the clinical trial data is going to tell you. But I can say what the status is. So there are two types of vaccines. So one is the 
mRNA vaccine from Moderna uh, from the USA. So they have already put down their plan for a phase three study. So that is the pivotal stage to demonstrate whether the vaccine has the efficacy that you want it to have in terms of showing immunity, protective immunity in humans. So those trials are going to start sometime by the end of July. So highly likely by the end of the year, we will know whether the vaccine is going to be, you know, protected. But I want to, you know, add some caution here, which is that many a times you have a control arm in a trial and then you have an active arm, right? And the control arm are people who are not receiving the COVID vaccine. So as a result, you will expect some proportion of that control arm to develop infection. And then they're going to look at, and they're expecting people to be out in the public or follow whatever processes they do in their daily lives. So now if the rate of infection or infectivity between these two groups differ substantially in that, those who receive the vaccine seem to develop less infection, then they can say the vaccine is protective. But if the control arm people don't develop as much infection, then it's going to take us a long time to figure out whether the vaccine is protective or not. That's why I'm hesitant to say when the vaccine will come out, because there is a stage where we have to allow natural infection to happen in the control arm to show that those in the vaccinated arm are protected, right? So that's one. So that's the Moderna vaccine. And then the Oxford uh, vaccine, um, you know, which is a huge partnership between Oxford University and the UK, as well as AstraZeneca, they are right now in the phase two, where they're looking at different age groups to see how um, you know, safe it is for the vaccine uh, to be delivered to people in different age groups. And then eventually they'll design a study uh, with people who are 18 years and older um, as their pivotal trial. So that is also slated to begin rather quickly. And, and a, a total of almost 10,000 um, you know, um, subjects will be studied as part of that trial. So all the way from phase one all to phase three, and once again, those results should be available by the end of the year as well. Okay. But, but subject to the control arm uh, developing sufficient number of infections for them to differentiate whether the vaccinated arm is protected compared to the control arm. Ah, so, so there's no straight, quick answer for this. Okay. There isn't because we cannot predict, you know, what the rate of infectivity will be in that control arm. Obviously, they have predicted some based on the current infection rate, but it depends on what happens in the actual study. Uh, I read in the paper something about Serum Institute uh, signing up some MOU with AstraZeneca. What was that? So a Serum Institute has signed up to manufacture the, oh. uh, the Oxford University vaccine in India. So they've actually already started manufacturing at risk because it's a proven technology. So Adar Punawala has invested a lot of money and he's already um, you know, started manufacturing at risk so that once the vaccine's efficacy is proven, it can be immediately available for immunizing people. No, you said it's still not ready. What is he manufacturing? I mean, sorry, I didn't understand. He's manufacturing, the, so, so the construct is ready, right? So they have a product that's ready. Okay. He just doesn't know whether it's going to work or not. Nobody knows whether it's going to work or not. Okay. Okay. But because previously a vaccine of the same sort has worked for another, you know, okay. viral disorder. So, so but in principle, the design should work. Okay. But whether it's going to be protective against COVID-19, this particular, you know, vaccine design for COVID-19 is going to work is not known. But because the same design principles have worked for another infection, so he's taking the risk of investing ahead, knowing the enormity of the, you know, infection in, in India and, you know, elsewhere in the world. So this is called investment at risk, where they have already started manufacturing the vaccine. Oh, thanks for the clarity there. Now, the next question is, you know, India, we have been slowly opening up for business and expectedly there is a deluge of cases the government still say that the community spread has not started. Uh, this is something I do not understand. What is community spread and why it is important in the management of COVID? Yeah, so it's an interesting question, right? So when they say community spread has not happened, that means they are saying that every new infection that is coming or is being reported, they're able to trace 
those individuals have been in contact with somebody who was exposed to the virus or so that the contact tracing is there, that they've been to a region where there is, um, you know, COVID uh, endemically or, you know, there is an outbreak of COVID or, you know, so, so, so that's what community, um, um, you know, uh, tracing is. So if they're not able to trace that and you have this asymptomatic transmission, then they know that it's spreading very fast. Right now they are saying that that has not happened yet that they believe that whatever they are seeing so far in India, um, it's not because of community spread. It's rather that they're able to do this contact tracing, that it's people who are known to have the COVID have spread it to so many others. So when you take... So a, their containment practices are not working. Uh, when you take... So the social distancing is not being maintained. Okay. You know, people are not, uh, you know, wearing the masks so that they're not spreading the infection. All of that is not, you know, being practiced effectively. Okay, uh, sorry. When you take a hundred people, yeah, how many number of people are required so that you cannot trace back to to define it as uh, community uh, uh, spread? I mean, is there a number that someone uh, would WHO or someone? There is no such magical number, right? Okay. So the question is. The idea of contact tracing is if you are able to stop the infection from spreading, right? So like what they were trying to do in Kerala where they were asking and tracking people with their mobile phones. So when you land up and you say you have a high temperature, so they ask you to go into quarantine, right? Then they're able to control that infection in that location. They're saying, okay, I have isolated this individual to this one location. And hopefully, if nobody else comes in contact with them. So what they do is to go back and trace people whom you ha may have been in contact with prior to that and warn you that, hey, somebody whom you were in contact with two days ago has now been diagnosed with COVID. So you may want to isolate yourself. So currently, the situation is whoever is being newly identified as being infected in India, they're saying they're able to contract trace them to somebody else who had that infection. So the point where, for instance, if I develop fever today and go to the hospital and you ask me the question, so did you travel to a country where there's COVID, you know, uh, outbreak of COVID? And I say, no, I haven't taken any international travel. Have you come in contact with somebody who's known to be a COVID positive? And they say, absolutely not. You know, do you go out, you know, without wearing a mask? No. You know, all those questions. If, if I check all these boxes as no, 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 then there's the first known case of asymptomatic transmission, oh, okay. right? So they have to have sufficient number of asymptomatic transmission to say that there is community spread happening now where we cannot trace where it came from. I mean, is community spread a good thing or is it expected? I think that's how it should progress, right? They expect it. It's going to eventually happen but they hope that it happens, you know, um, not before they have a vaccine. Like if they have a vaccine, they can protect people, right? But community spread will happen asymptomatically when people just go out and interact not knowing they have it. That's why they're asking us to wear these masks so you don't unknowingly spread the infection. Okay, wow. So uh, this is going to be a very, uh, you know, it's question close to my heart. So. I read that in a single cough or sneeze could contain as many as 200 million viral particles. I don't know if this is right, but I read this. I was wondering, you know, to start an infection, how many viruses are needed? I'm asking about the numbers. Is just one enough? So you're talking about the infectious dose, right? That's what we refer to it in, you know, in the terms. Okay. Um, for COVID, it is not known yet. There's a lot of things that is not known about COVID, okay. right? But from looking at how contagious it is, that is, you know, you could spread it quite readily, you know, through your sneeze or your cough and, or, you know, its ability to remain on surfaces, it probably requires quite a low dose, but it's very hard to quantify what that dose is. Okay. It's not known yet. I mean, eventually it will be, and that's what we should be working toward, but it is not known yet. But there is a difference, you know, so if you get exposed to a very low dose of it, you do see milder symptoms. There are individuals who reported very mild symptoms of COVID. They say that majority of people are able to recover at home. Some of it may be related to their health conditions. Other could be related to just the dose of, 
infectious particles they were exposed to as opposed to others who really were exposed to a full you know um, or a high uh, dose of uh, viral load which becomes then overwhelming and they become really ill very quickly okay that's so the viral um, infection dose matters okay that's what you call as viral load okay the more the number of viruses you say the load is higher yeah, so the infectious dose, if there are a higher number of particles, then it becomes, you know, um, harder for individuals to manage it. Okay, okay. Now, viewers, uh, this is a very important question that I am going to ask Dr. Meena Subramaniam. And this is a long question. So, I wanted to ask Dr., you know, the question is about the efficiency of the type of mask you choose to wear. I have read that COVID-19 virus is of the size approximately 100 nanometers. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And nanometer viewers is about one millionth of a millimeter. Very, very small, you know. So I read that a single layer mask from cloth has pores, that's the holes, several times larger than the virus. I made a visual representation for you and this is only approximate. So, so don't hold me to it. Dr. Mina Subramaniam, once I'm finished showing this, Please do correct me if I'm wrong. You know, in Tamil, this is what I, I, I hope you can see it. Yeah, this is what, yes. uh, uh, this is called in Tamil as a sundaka. It's called a turkey berry. Huh? If this were the size of one COVID-19 virus, the holes in your normal single layer mask would be the size of this tennis ball. Okay, do you see the comparison? The virus would simply fly through a poor quality mask. Let this sink in. The tennis ball is the size of the pore in a poor quality mask. And the sundaka, the taki berry, is the size of the COVID-19 virus. Okay. If I am right about this, uh, so the question to you, Dr. Mina Subramaniam, is what kind of mask are we to wear to prevent this from happening? I request you to answer for two types of people. The first type who remain all the time home and open doors only to receive deliveries, home deliveries, and the second type who go out on work, a nine to five work. Right, so there are two ways of looking at it, right? First of all, um, coronavirus can only be seen through an electron microscope. So it tells you already, it's like minuscule, right? So what you said is right, it's 100 nanometers, right? 0.1 micron size is what it is. And that's how it was discovered um, under the electron microscope. So in terms of masks, there are two ways of thinking about it, right? The cloth masks, as I said in my previous uh, conversation with you, is to really uh, prevent you from transmitting it to others, right? So to prevent your um, sputum or from your saliva from traveling across and infecting another person, particularly when you're unaware that you're carrying the virus, right? So that's your asymptomatic transmission. So it, all it prevents you is from spitting out at somebody else, the virus. It's not protecting you in any way. So I want to reiterate that, right? And you're right that the virus can come straight through the, you know, the, the, um, the holes in the cloth. Um, if you were to be next to a person who's very infective, right? And they were speaking to you in close quarters that you were now, you know, getting those droplets of, um, um, you know, sputum or uh, whatever things that were coming out from their um, uh, mucus passages. Yeah. So in terms of protection, right? So the second uh, grade of masks are the surgical masks. And then the other masks are the N95 masks. So these are made by 3M. And the N95 masks, N95 stands for, it's able to push out 95% of the microbial particles. Actually, it can protect uh, particle, uh, uh, prevent the entry of particles that are 10 times smaller than the COVID mm -hmm. virus. So it can protect now all the way down to 10 nanometer, right? So this, I said you, this one is 0.1 micron, so um, down to 0.01 micron or even lower. So N95 is probably the, you know, the highest rated if there are, you know, beyond that is N100 masks as well. But um, they are not recommending for the general public to be donning the N95 masks and walking around for two reasons. First, these masks need to be fitted properly so that they offer the protection uh, that they can. And second is they are in short supply. 
So they're reserving these masks for the frontline, um, you know, medical labor workers and hospital staff. So they really don't want people to make a rush to the stores or to Amazon and order these masks because that's really depriving of the frontline workers from having them, right? And in most typical situations, um, I think you don't need to have that. So your question was about a person who is going to work, right? So it depends on um, where they are, you know, what mode of transportation they are using to get to work. If they are using their own car or if they're using a you know, motorcycle or something to get to work, covering their face with a cloth mask is good enough because they're not actually in conversation when they are traveling with somebody, nor are they speaking, hopefully. Right, they are just driving or they're going. If they are, if they are in the car with another person, they should probably avoid conversations, or they should have a you know a, like a cloth mask when they are um, you know traveling. Um, I think that's the most I can tell you at this time. I mean, the best known protective masks are the N95 masks or the ones which have a higher designation. Um, a surgical masks they are quite uncomfortable to wear for long periods of time. So what you're talking about is not intermittent wearing of something and then removing it, right? If you're going to be in a place where you're going to be exposed to people, you have to have the ability to have it on for some time. And uh, so this is what you have to be thinking about. Uh, so viewers, now don't go rush by that N95. As doctor says, all these are required for frontline warriors. Good. That was a timely you know, reminder for us. The next question is um, about, you know, this is a dicey thing. We have been seeing flip-flops from uh, reports saying about asymptomatics cannot transmit chloroquine, works, does not work. So these two questions, if you can answer, please. So, you know that the WHO withdrew their statement that asymptomatics do not, um, you know, transmit, right? So these are all evolving anecdotal statements that, you know, people come up with one day and then, then to, uh, the next day they retract it. So I think we should not uh, get too distracted by that. You have to believe the fact that asymptomatics do transmit, right? It's, um, and, and this is exactly what is happening in many parts of the world. So um, we are still trying to learn a lot about the virus. Now coming to um, chloroquine and, um, you know, drugs like that, um, once again, you know, it's um, the evidence is, has to be collected from randomized trials. But unfortunately, there are some observational studies that were completed that showed that chloroquine doesn't work. And then there are a whole bunch of observational studies that are saying chloroquine may work. So none of these are conclusive until you have, as I mentioned previously, randomized studies where you have patients either on chloroquine or not on chloroquine and who are matched on many of their other, um, you know, um, conditions in terms of their health status, their age, you know, many of the other physical uh, conditions to say that whether this drug really works or not. It's a very difficult trial to run, particularly when you're in the middle of a pandemic to say, does this drug work or not? Because when somebody is experiencing the symptoms and then you give them chloroquine and they feel a little better, then you tend to believe that the drug works. But that doesn't mean that it, it worked only because of chloroquine. It could have contributed somewhat, but it doesn't mean definitively that chloroquine, you know, resolved the condition, right? So it's difficult to draw that conclusion. So far, there is no substantiated evidence from a randomized trial that chloroquine works. That's a fact, right? So we'll have to wait for the um, evidence to come out. Wow. Okay. Now, this is, uh, I wanted to share with you a story about... Um, I keep speaking to the uh, friends, doctors who are uh, in COVID duty. And this is about one troubling case of a person, a very healthy person having a very, little, very slight breathing problem. He walks into the hospital. He wants a, a checkup to be done. He tests positive. And then uh, doctors admit him to the ICU just to you know, keep, uh, keep track of what's happening. And in 48 hours, he dies. This is a very healthy person, no comorbid conditions. So why do sometimes, this is not happening all the time. This is one, one case which I came across. So why do sometimes healthy people die? Those are tough questions, right? Because it's very um, difficult. I mean, we, first of all, when you say a healthy person, Healthy defined by what, 
by who, okay. right? Because always I say healthy is apparent healthy, right? You could put that in quotes because not all of us are constantly looking at all of our physiological parameters to say, how healthy are we at any given day time? You know, there may be some underlying conditions, but not just, you know, self, but as I said, beyond that, there are also many unknowns about the virus. You know, it could have been the infectious dose this person was exposed to. It may have been an overactive immune system in this individual that was trying to be protective, right? Because he was healthy and he probably had a very good immune system. And hyperimmune reaction is one of the reasons. So ARDS is a condition, you know, where you have a hyperimmune activation that contributes to the damage that is seen in the lung. So a multitude of reasons could have contributed. Uh, so it's very hard to just comment on why this individual may have passed away so quickly and so rapidly, um, you know, so. Wow. Okay. I hear about you should have pulse oximeters. What is it and why do we need to buy one? So it's, you're not, uh, it's not necessary to buy one, but it's always uh, uh, good to have one. Okay. Um, uh, but only because it's a very simple way of understanding um, how well your heart is functioning, right? So pulse oximetry is a very um, you know, elegant way to figure out whether your blood is oxygenated. So you just clip this thing on to the tip of your fingers or the tip of your toes because it's the, the most peripheral part where blood is being carried to. And what you want to understand is uh, the efficiency of blood exchange uh, or, you know, or oxygenation um, of the blood. Um, and um, so with the pulse of a light, so this is just light transmission, you figure out the difference between oxygenated and uh, deoxygenated or non-oxygenated blood. And it tells you the proportion or the percentage of, um, you know, oxygenation you have. So it's important to make sure that you prevent uh, hypoxia to the brain, um, particularly in COVID conditions, because it affects the lungs, and um, you know, oxygen uh, oxygenation is so dependent on you know uh, good breathing practices and being able to maintain that uh, exchange in the lung. People have tend to have this oximeter, pulse oximeter, to uh, monitor whether the um, you know uh, oxygenation is dropping. So if it drops below ninety five percent, then they recommend you to you know uh, start monitoring it more closely and then i think below 92% you have to uh, call the physician right away so it's it's a good thing to have uh, a pulse oximeter at your home right okay. yes yes it's a very simple technology but it's uh, useful to monitor yeah. the last few questions are from uh, my neighbors and my friends okay this is about we wash vegetables sanitize what is not consumed when we bring that bring them to into our homes the question is can the virus be transmitted through vegetables paper plastic clothing currency notes ceramic or glass cups if yes for how long do they stay in each so there have been so many articles that have come out about this um, and you know the 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 timelines and the, uh, you know, uh, it, it varies so widely. But one thing to remember is the virus lives on living things, right? So it's the contamination on vegetables, it's the contamination on surfaces, that is the problem. So this is why they tell us to wash everything down very well. First of all, protect your hands with gloves, wash everything down with soap and water because that lip lipids in the soap washes things off. And I think that is the best that we can do. And in terms of vegetables, it may be good to strip out the outer skin layer so that you're removing another contaminated surface and then cook the vegetables. You know, if, if you're so worried, don't you eat fresh salads, cook the vegetable. Okay. You know, in terms of other surfaces like plastic and paper, wipe them down with a disinfectant okay. and maybe let them sit for, you know, hours. You know, first they said 30 minutes, then some papers have said it can live there up to three hours. Now I hear it's up to seven days. So I don't know what to believe anymore because there's evidence coming from different parts of the world. But it all goes back to, you know, it has to be like something from, you know, a, a mucus secretion that has fallen there, right? Because that's where the virus is coming from. Yeah. So it's a matter of really washing those things off. So I really don't have a simple answer for you except to say, 
wash your hands like crazy. I mean, I literally, all my skin is peeling off. I'm like so paranoid. (laughs) Besides wrapping myself in plastic, I don't know what else to do. (laughs) Okay. This is a question from my 70-year-old neighbor. Okay. So if someone is tested positive next door or in a different floor in my apartment complex, can the virus somehow work its way into my home? and infect me through air, water, or the dream? So, first of all, you know, the air, water, or drain. Only if the person is directly in contact in terms of, you know, within a distance to transmit it directly, right, from the, um, either through um, the saliva or through... Um, through a sneeze like mucus particles, which is the most common way it is transmitted. I am not familiar with of the virus being transmitted through air vents unless the air vents, you know, is being overpowered with somebody, you know, sneezing into it. You know, it all depends on how the air circulation is. Air circulation in apartment complexes is something that is of concern, um, but um, I haven't heard of it being a particularly an issue Um, when um, there isn't a common, um, you know, like a duct that is running between these apartments. So I'm not able to, you know, really provide you an informative opinion about it, except to say that, you know, person to person, like, you know, maintain the distance of the six feet distance that's being recommended and wear a mask, but I'm not so sure whether it travels, you know, between apartments that way. The last question is another friend. He says, I wanted to ask this as an afterthought. Was all the lockdown that destroyed the economies needed after all? So from a scientist perspective, I think that has actually contained the damage. It could have been much worse. I think because nations went into lockdown as rapidly as they did, I think we've been able to really control and manage the infection. First of all, we have learned how to deal with the virus. When it came out, nobody even understood. Remember that physician who originally diagnosed it, he died off it, you know, which is so sad, right? So I think it has given us some time and space to understand how to deal with the virus so that we could treat people who are coming down with the infection better. Right. And it's also um, not really made it a human calamity. You know, even though we have had way too many deaths, we could have prevented it even more. It's believed if we had contained it sooner. Right. Gone into the social distancing. The measure. was essential. Okay. In my opinion, it is. I mean, there are enough naysayers, you know, who cite the Sweden experiment, which is yet to be seen whether it's been totally successful or not. And we, so, are, we will keep seeing more lockdowns as staggered lockdowns, that's what you say, right? Right. At, so what at least we are seeing in America is as uh, states are beginning to reopen, there are more and more spikes that are happening. But uh, the good thing is the mortality rate hasn't really increased so much. It is still there. But it's in some states it's going up, but in many of the states it's coming down, even though there are, you know, Uh, newer infections that are happening, which also tells us that we are beginning to learn how to manage it better. So, Last words, are there anything else that you want to add, Dr. Mina Subramanian? I think, you know, if we follow simple measures, we can really get through this. I don't think people should become so paranoid about it because what we are asked to do is not something that is so drastic or heroic. Yes, I know it's not fun to be isolated, but being isolated for a month can probably save us 10 months down the road of not being able to return back to normal life or social, you know, socializing with others. And by then the vaccine will be there, right? There are two candidates that are looking promising. They've gone through the early stages um, and they look safe enough to be now tried in larger cohorts of patients and they're testing it in up to 10,000 patients. So this should give us some confidence, not patients, I should say in, volunteers. Um, it, this should give us confidence that, you know, there is something that's coming around the corner. So, wow. so I, I, I ask you to remain optimistic. So viewers, there it is for you. Please stay safe. Always wear a good mask when you have to step out of your home. Stay safe. Don't rush to, buy, yeah, don't rush to buy the N95 mask. These are required by the frontline warriors. Many thanks, Dr. Meena Subramanian, for answering the questions which have been troubling us for quite some time. 
viewers stay strong stay safe until next time thank you very thanks much thanks for giving me a chance to answer some of these questions bye bye, bye.